Well, good morning. So good to see you today, and I thank you for that introduction and, and welcome. It is a privilege for me to get to be here with you today. And uh, today I have a challenge because, uh, as with all preachers, I've got about 35 minutes or so, and I have a lot on my heart that I want to share with you. Some of it involves, uh, as you heard Dr. Aiken refer to our son Trey, I'm going to tell you some of his story. But if you have your Bible, would you go ahead and open to John chapter 11? And uh, go ahead and open there real quickly. And uh, I'm going to get to John 11 in just a moment. But uh, Dr. Aiken kind of shared a little bit of my, of, of, of my background. But I was saved as a 16-year-old. I went to a, a Christian school in San Antonio, Texas. I grew up. My dad's in the ministry. He, was, he served on churches for a number, a number of years, but uh, has been in full-time evangelism now for over 30 years and uh, does a great job with that. But when I was 16 years old, I realized I'd never given my life to Christ. And so I surrendered my heart to the Lord. And uh, as a junior in high school, then the very next year, I felt God calling me to the ministry. And I ended up in Oklahoma. And uh, I never thought I'd be in Oklahoma. But I went up there at Oklahoma Baptist, found my wife. We've been married for 15 years, as you heard, five children. And uh, God has been so very, very good to us. I've been pastoring at First Baptist Newcastle. Does anybody know where Newcastle is? Let me see. Okay, good. Three of you. Excellent. Wonderful. Yes. Uh, Newcastle. I've been pastoring there for over five years, and God has really blessed our church. We've seen a number of people come to know Christ, and, and we continue to uh, hopefully make disciples of all nations. But my life has taken a bit of a turn, and uh, some things have happened in our lives that we never foresaw, we never anticipated. And I know that in this room, we all come from different backgrounds. Some in here are seminary students only. Uh, some are pastoring or in ministry or church planting or professors or maybe here visiting. Uh, some in here are married. Some have children. Some have grand grandchildren. We all come from different places in our, in our lives and, and here today. But I want to talk to you today about something that I think we all need to be reminded of. Something that God has taught me uh, in the last couple of years. We, uh, our son Trey was born in 2006, and Trey was born, as one of our other sons was born, uh, as what they call the bubble boy disease. Trey was born without an immune system, no ability to live in the outside world. Trey had to have a bone marrow transplant when he was a baby. Our oldest daughter at the time, Brittany, who was five, donated bone marrow for Trey in an effort to give him an opportunity to have a chance to live in the world. Trey received chemotherapy as a baby. His immune uh, wiped out all of his cells. Uh, Brittany gave bone marrow, and uh, Trey was in the hospital for about three months, and everything appeared to, to be working. Trey lived a normal, healthy life for six years. He developed a, a pretty strong immune system, all things considered. But uh, in 2012, Trey started kindergarten. He was five years old, or six years old, and uh, Trey began to get sick within the first month of, of kindergarten. We weren't sure what was going on, but he wasn't getting well. So we ended up taking him to several doctors and we discovered very quickly that Trey had developed a, a problem related to his blood, to his cells. And in 2012, the worst news possibly could have come to us. We found out that Trey had developed a very rare form of leukemia, what they call large granular leukemia. And Trey was in need of another bone marrow transplant. And so again, long story short, but Trey received another bone marrow transplant in December of 2012 as a six-year-old, again from his daughter, from our daughter, his sister, Brittany. And uh, things looked to be going well. Trey went through another round of chemotherapy, the high, most high-dose chemo you can receive, wiped out all of his cells. He rece received Brittany's bone marrow again. And in January, things appeared to be going well. But from January to September of 2013, Trey fought very hard. He battled every single day. And those cancer cells that we hoped to wipe out and eliminate ended up coming back, and they came back stronger than ever. And so for the next several months, Trey bravely fought uh, cancer. And you're going to hear more about this at the end, but Trey earned the nickname Super Trey because he fought with such endurance and courage and strength. But on September the 1st of 2013, the Lord called Trey home. And as you can imagine, for the last year, our lives have been uh, in a series of, of moments of healing. We have had the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. But what I want to talk to you about today is the purpose of God. Because many of you are like me in here. I, I've sat by the bedside of someone who's lost a loved one. I've consoled, I'm doing a funeral tomorrow for a man who uh, died tragically from, from, lung, from lung disease. And I'm, I've been on the side of ministry. 
But I'm telling you, when you sit on the bedside of your seven-year-old son who's getting ready to step into eternity, and you know you won't see him on this side of eternity again, boy, you find yourself oftentimes ill-prepared for that. And the Lord has been growing us in some significant ways over the last two years. Selfishly, I wish my son were here. I ran the Chicago Marathon in his honor, and I, and I tried to run with the strength and the endurance that he exhibited, exhibited to me in his journey. But nonetheless, I have discovered something about the purpose of God. And I want to share with you from John chapter 11 this morning. Because one of the things that my wife and I and our family have come to discover is, at the end of the day, either we trust God or we don't. In a sinful, fallen world, bad things are going to happen. In a sinful, fallen world, hard things are going to happen. And sometimes, even as Christians, we pray for good things. It was a good thing for us to pray for our son to be healed. And we've prayed for many other things in our lives, for good things. And when those things don't happen as we think they ought to, we find out in those moments what we really believe about the God that we serve and we follow. Now, these songs that we sang this morning, I didn't know what they were going to be singing. But it's interesting that we focused on the cross and the resurrection because truly, had Jesus Christ not been raised from the dead, then our faith and our preaching is in vain. Amen? Had Christ not been raised, then everything that we do is in vain. And the resurrection has taken on even more meaning, new meaning to me, and important meaning in my life in the last couple of years. And I'm going to share why from John chapter 11. But let me just ask you a question as we get started this morning. Here's the question. What is the purpose of your life? What is the purpose of your life? You now, for us as Christians, all of us would probably say, well, the ultimate purpose of our life is to bring glory to God. We would say that. And boy, I would have said that many, many times for many, many years as a Christian. But what I've discovered is that is true. The purpose of our life is to bring glory to God. But this is the reality. God likes to bring glory to himself, often in ways that we don't necessarily understand often in ways that are hard or difficult. You see that all throughout the scripture. The purpose of our life is indeed to bring glory to God. My wife and I, one of our family verses is Nahum 1-7 that says, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who trust in him. We know this verse, but we've been living this verse. We know that what God does, he does for his glory and for our good. We know those things. But the reality is, is now they've taken on a whole new meaning to us as we've been on a journey of healing through our own struggle in our own lives. We've discovered that, yes, the purpose of our life is to bring glory to God, but this has been a journey that God has taught us through some difficult things. We come to John chapter 11. John 11 is a very familiar passage of Scripture. And if I were preaching as I normally do, preaching expositionally, expository preaching, we would have been walking through the book of John. We'd all have the context and the background, but we don't have time to go into all of that this morning. But we know this, that in John chapter 11, Jesus is coming to the end of his earthly ministry and getting ready to head toward Jerusalem, where, of course, he's going to be crucified and raised from the dead. So we come to John 11, and Jesus is getting ready to do one of his final miracles, perhaps the greatest earthly miracle he did before being crucified and raised back to life. This powerful miracle Jesus did, as with all of his miracles, was to teach a lesson, was to teach something about himself. We know that Jesus did miracles, yes, to show his power over earthly things, but ultimately his power over all things. And so today what I want to talk about is the prevailing purpose of God. I want us to think about why God does what he does and how we can learn to embrace what God does by faith. Look at John chapter 11 and look at these first few verses. John 11. It says, Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, I love this verse, when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. It's very interesting, isn't it? This is a story that many of us have preached and heard preached and read for a number of years. 
But when I look at this, the very first thing I want to talk about is that God has a purpose for everything. If you're taking notes, you may want to jot that down. God has a purpose for everything. There's a reason that he allows what he allows and does what he does. For those of you that are here today, wherever you are in life, you are where you are because God has a purpose in that. This is one of the most intriguing parts of the story to me. Well, we're going to get to those famous verses in just a moment, verses 24 and 25. But in these first six verses, we see some interesting things. We see that Jesus had these friends, Mary and Martha and their brother, Lazarus. And we know that throughout Jesus' ministry, he loved these people. They were as family to him almost. And we see some wonderful moments that Jesus shared with them. So it's interesting that Jesus finds out that Lazarus is ill. And he had to have known this was a serious illness, of course. He was God, but the word had traveled that Lazarus was still and, uh, sick until the point of death. And so if you found out today that someone you loved was sick to the point of death, what would you do? You would find every way possible to get there as quickly as you can. And it's interesting to me that verse 6, it says, When Jesus heard that Lazarus was ill, what did he do? He stayed two days longer. That's interesting to me. One of the things that Emily and I have discovered is that God operates on a sovereign and perfect timetable. And what he does, he does for a reason. And he simply asks us to trust him. Because our God is up to greater things than we could ever know or ever see. We have to trust him though. And it comes back to verse 4. Why was Jesus doing what he was doing? Was he just being random? Was he just trying to prove some sort of a point? Or what was he doing? No, he had a reason. Look at verse 4. It says, when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Remember that. He states that. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Wow, what an amazing reminder what we see in this story is that Jesus is saying from the very beginning that this is not going to end in death. This is going to end for my glory. A Christian's greatest desire should be verse 4. A Christian's greatest desire should be, God, do whatever you've got to do to bring glory to yourself. I remember one particular day, Emily and I were in the hospital with our son Trey. And I remember we were praying and we had many moments of crisis in Trey's journey. There were times he had to go to the ICU. There were times we didn't think he was going to make it all throughout the journey. And I remember one time just praying over my son and praying, God, do whatever you've got to do to bring yourself the most glory. And I remember Emily looked at me after I said amen and she said, are you sure you want to pray that? Because we knew what that might mean. And I will tell you that even though I was praying the right things in my heart, I wasn't sure I wanted what I knew or what I thought was coming down that road. But here it is, God's saying, I'm going to do what I'm going to do for my glory. Jesus delayed going to see Lazarus, knowing he would die so that he would do something greater. You need to remember that. He delayed going to see him. He was waiting for him to die because he was going to do something greater. So often we would like for God to bring glory to himself in ways that we understand or ways in time frames that we would, we would uh, support. But what I've discovered in my life is that God often does things in ways that go counter to what we think is right. But his ways are always best. His purposes are always best. Look at John chapter 11, though. Look at verse 17. Uh, obviously, verses 5 through 16, Jesus has some time with his disciples, but we're going to skip through that and come to verse 17. It says, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. And look what Martha says to Jesus. Martha said to him, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. Something that I've discovered and continue to discover is that God's purpose, yes, he has a purpose for all things, but his purpose for us as Christians must be embraced by faith. It must be embraced by faith. If we were to look at all of this story, we would discover that even the disciples had questions about what Jesus was doing. In verses 7 through 16, they're asking him questions about this. They demonstrate some confusion and lack of understanding. And of course, Mary does, and we're going to see Martha as well. 
Mary approaches Jesus, as she often did. She was often the first to come out to talk to him. And she said, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. What Martha was doing was, of course, what all of us would be doing is saying, God, you've got the power. Why didn't you do this? So often we said that very same thing in our journey with Trey. God, we know you have the power to heal him. Why aren't you doing this? At just this moment, God, you could lay your hand on him and the cancer could be gone. Lord, why are you not doing this? And what I've discovered is that when we miss understand or when we miss God's purpose that can lead to very frustrating places in our life when we walk by sight instead of by faith we'll live in a constant state of frustration with God as a pastor I deal with this all the time with people who say Jeremy I prayed about this and this didn't happen why not or Jeremy this happened and you know all of these kinds of things and I've counseled people I've given them the right answers but for me This has become, uh, in Trey's journey, more than just answers. This has become, am I going to believe everything I've been preaching and teaching all of these years? Am I going to say, God, I trust you in the midst of the, 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 the most difficult thing that's ever happened in my life? And I will say that in the last two years when I have walked by sight, I've been frustrated and not understood. But when I've walked by faith, God has given peace and comfort to our soul. And here we see Martha saying, Lord, had you been here this would not have happened. See, Martha represents many of us. We don't get to see the big picture always. We get to see our little part of the canvas. And when we don't see how our part fits into the master plan, it leads to frustration. And we say, God, what are you doing? There are many of you, maybe even in this room, saying, God, why have you allowed what you've allowed into my life? Or why has this taken place? You're going to be in churches where people ask you those questions. Why is this happening? And when we walk by sight, we won't understand those things. And those things will frustrate us. And we'll be like Martha saying, God, if you would have just done this, this would not have happened. But we know in verse 4, God's always at work. He's always doing something greater. He's doing something that we can't always see, which is why we must continue to trust him. So Martha says to him, Lord, if you would have been here my brother would not have died. Look at verses 22. He says, but even, she says, but even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Again, Martha's saying the right things, and we often say the right things, but in her heart, there was still some unbelief as we're going to see. Jesus said, Martha, your brother will rise again. Jesus was testing her, and Martha said to him, oh, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day, but look at this, and we're going to come back to this at the end. But Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. He says, Martha, do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I I believe you're the Christ, the Son of God, who's coming into the world. Verse 28, when she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, again, she said the same thing that Martha did. Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her weeping, He was deeply moved in the spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Jesus is doing something here. He's teaching something. And when we embrace God's purpose for our lives by faith, it is only God who can bring peace to our pain and clarity to our situation. Two things I've discovered in this fallen world. Number one is, in a sinful fallen world, bad things are going to happen. In a sinful fallen world, yes, even to you as a Christian, your worst nightmare can come true. It's, it could happen in a fallen world. We, we often think sometimes we're, we as Christians might be exempt from trials and difficulties. In a sinful fallen world, things are going to happen. Bad things are going to happen. But here's the second thing I've discovered. Our God, our sovereign God, who not even a blade of grass moves without his permission, is in control of all things. Amen? He's in sovereign control of all things. 
But as I've looked at this passage, and I've seen it a number of times, I love this because Mary comes out, and she falls at Jesus' feet, and she says, if you would have been here. Again, same thing that Martha said from a broken perspective, though. Lord, if you would have been here, my brothers would not have died. How many times have you heard people say, Lord, if you would have done this, this would not have happened. If you would have done this, this would not have happened. And we found ourselves questioning and wondering, God, where are you? And behind all of it, God is orchestrating a plan that while not it may, may not make sense to us right now, in the end it will. And here Jesus looks, and it says in verse 33, when he saw her weeping and the Jews who had come weeping, look, he was deeply moved. I love this about Jesus. I love this about our God. It says he was moved in the spirit and troubled. And of course, the famous verse, John eleven thirty five, 35, it says Jesus wept. And we know that Jesus did not weep as they were weeping. Jesus wasn't grieving because he didn't have hope. You think about this for a moment. Jesus knew what he was about to do. Jesus knew he was about to raise Lazarus from the dead. So why in the world would Jesus, the son of God, who was about to perform one of his greatest earthly miracles, why would he weep? And this is what the Lord has spoken to me through his word in this truth. Yes, Jesus weeps over our unbelief. And yes, he weeps that they were still doubting. This was a, a, a definitely a lesson in faith. But I'm convinced with all of my heart that Jesus was weeping because he hates the effects of sin on the fallen world way more than we do. Jesus one day is going to make all things right in what's called the new heaven and the new earth where all sin is wiped away and done away with forever. God does not enjoy our pain God doesn't enjoy uh, allowing us to be inflicted. He doesn't allow seeing the, uh, he doesn't allow, uh, or he doesn't enjoy watching the effect of sin uh, grieve us as we watch our loved ones suffer. God doesn't enjoy our pain. He wants to make all things new and he will make all things new. So he weeps with us. On September the 1st, 2013, could God have healed our son? Emily and I believed even after Trey breathed his last breath, God could raise him right there. We, we knew God could do it. But in those moments, what I have discovered is that God was weeping alongside of us, grieving with us, reminding us that one day he will make all things new. And we see the Lord weeping here with them. God sees our pain. He knows our pain. He feels our pain. Hebrews says he suffers alongside of us. He weeps with a purpose. Jesus, of course, the master, uh, setting the example of our lives. When he was on the cross, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yes, we know he wasn't forsaken, but he declared he felt forsaken. I love what Charles Spurgeon said. He said, there are seasons when the brightness of our father's smile is eclipsed by clouds and darkness. But let us remember that God never does really forsake us. O oh, thou poor distressed soul who once lived in the sunshine of God's face but art now in darkness, remember that he has not really forsaken thee. God in the clouds is as much our God as when he shines forth in all the luster of his grace. Amen? God's purpose, embracing God's purpose, it brings peace to our pain and clarity to our situation and hope to our despair. But do we trust him? That's why Jesus said to Martha, do you believe this? Well, look what happens. And we know in verse 38 through 44, Jesus deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor. He's been dead four days. It just goes to reveal that Martha was still missing the purpose. Martha had said earlier that whatever you ask from God, he will give you. Martha was still missing the fact that Jesus could do the miracle right there. To Martha, yes, he had the power to heal the sick and one day raise the dead, but she wasn't even thinking of what he could do right then. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on the account of the people standing around that they may believe you sent me. When he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face un unwrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said, unbind him and let him go. Wow, what a powerful scene. But I want you to keep it all in perspective. What had Jesus just told Martha in verses 24 and 25? He said, I am the resurrection and the life. In other words, Jesus did this miracle, of course, to validate what he was saying earlier. 
We know that Jesus did all earthly miracles, not only to show his power over the physical world, but his power over all things, even death. And one of the things that Emily and I have discovered, and I know you continue to discover, is that God's purpose does prevail over all things, even death. Because in Christ, he is the resurrection and the life. Jesus did this miracle to show his power. He waited for Lazarus to die, not because he didn't care, but because he was up to something greater, something eternal. He had a purpose, and his purpose showed his power over all things. So let me wrap this up. Back in verse 22, remember what Martha said. She said, even now I know that whatever you ask from God, he will give you. It's a great statement. But she was obviously still missing it because in verse 39, she said, Lord, there's going to be an odor. He's been dead. She wasn't even thinking about what he was going to do. But in verses 24 and 25, remember what Jesus said? He said, Martha, your brother will rise. And and, and Martha said, oh, I know he will rise on the last day. And that was a true statement because Lazarus was going to be raised, but he was going to die again. Jesus was the only one we know to be raised, right, to never die again. But Jesus says in verse 25, and listen, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, listen, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Jesus is raising Lazarus, validated that statement. He was living proof that he alone could make that declaration. It reminded me of when he healed the paralytic and and he said, your sins are forgiven. And they said, who are you to forgive sin? Only God can forgive sin. And Jesus said, so that you may know the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sin. I tell you to rise, get up and walk. And the man rose and walked. Jesus did his earthly miracles to show his greater power over eternal spiritual things. But I want you to hold on to verses 25 and 26 and turn to John chapter 5. And I want to close by telling you about how this has been special in our life. John chapter 5, look at verse 24. Let me begin to wrap this up. God has a purpose in all things. His purpose must be embraced by faith. His purpose prevails over all things. But John 5, 24, you know this verse, but I want to tell you how this verse came to life for me. John 5, 24, truly, truly, Jesus said, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me, listen, has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but he has passed from death to life from death to life. This is the essence of the gospel. This is what we're doing as Christians, as church planters, as missionaries, as pastors. We're calling people from death to life, amen? Only Jesus can set someone free. Yes, the resurrection was an event and the crucifixion, those were events and our faith is not in the events. They're in the one the events point to. In Jesus, back in John chapter 11, he said, Martha, stop looking down the road. Stop looking to a future resurrection. Jesus said, look at me. He said, I am the resurrection. The one who is the embodiment of all of this is right in front of you. He says, I'm the resurrection. I'm the life. Whoever believes, look in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who, and he says, and everyone who lives and believes in me, I love this, shall never, ever die. Our son Trey on January the 8th of 2013 was in the hospital with my wife, Emily. My son Trey has always had a sensitive heart to the Lord and to the gospel. Trey was the kind that was always thinking about the Lord and he, was, he would love to sing praise songs and he loved to hear Bible stories. On January the 8th though, he was laying in his bed and Trey had trouble sleeping at night. And that particular night, Emily had put him to bed and gone over to lay on the couch where she was sleeping. And she woke up sometime later and she looked over and Trey was laying awake in his bed as he often did. And, and remember this, he was six years old when this was taking place. He was laying in his bed awake. Emily went over and laid beside him and they began talking. And somewhere in that conversation, Trey said to Emily, he said, mom, am I going to die? That's a hard question when you know as a parent that the reality of death is is a significant possibility for what he was facing. And Emily, God gave my wife some tremendous words in in our journey to our son. Emily said to Trey, she said, Trey, well, you're not gonna die until the Lord's done with you here on earth. And Trey looked at her as a six-year-old and said, Mom, but I'm not a Christian yet. I've, I, I've never asked Jesus into my life. And so they began talking about that as we had done with Trey many, many times. And on January the 8th, Emily began to share once again with Trey the power of the gospel. And that night, something was special. That night, the Holy Spirit was really at work in Trey's life. And Trey repented of his sin. He confessed Christ as Lord. And that night, he invited Jesus to save him. 
there was a phrase that really connected with Trey, and it was the phrase boss. It's communicating Lord and Master to a child is hard, but Emily said, you need to ask Jesus to be the boss of your life. And that really connected with Trey, so much so that it's on his tombstone where it says, ask Jesus to be the boss of his life, January 8th, 2013. And that night, Trey passed, listen, from death to life in that hospital room. I remember getting a phone call that night at 11 and I was frantic. I grabbed my phone because whenever I'd get calls that, light, that, that late at night, it often wasn't good. And I remember answering and I heard sweet little Trey's voice on the other end of the line. It said, he said, the very first thing, I said, hello. And he said, I'm a Christian now. And I said, what? He said, I'm a Christian now. And the next thing he handed the phone to Emily and she told me the story. And she told me how Trey came to know Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior that night. Well, throughout Trey's journey from January to September, there were times that Trey didn't want to do something. And we'd say, Trey, who's your boss? And he'd say, Jesus, right? When he didn't want to take his medicine, Trey, who's your boss? Jesus. Trey spent over 280 days or so in the hospital between 2012 and 2013 as a six-year-old. He fought with heroic strength, strength only God could give. We talk about one of God's special graces to us was the way Trey handled suffering. Oh, he had moments where he was the typical six and seven-year-old for sure. But without question, he handled it with strength that God would give. That was one of God's graces to us. And I've discovered that if the only reason for Trey's suffering, if God's purpose in his suffering was for him to find Christ, then it was worth it. If that was the only reason he suffered, it was worth it. So in September, Emily had come home for the weekend. We never left Trey by himself with somebody else. Emily's father-in-law had gone up, but Emily wanted to come home for the weekend so we could be there with our other four children. They were getting ready to start school and had some activities, and we both wanted to be there. And so we sent our father-in-law, who is the next best thing, and Trey loved, loves Emily's dad, loved Emily's father. He was there, and when Emily left Trey on Friday, he was doing pretty good. The doctor even came by and said, this is how I like to see Trey. We got a call in the middle of the night on Saturday night, and the, and the, the nurse was saying, I'm not trying to alarm you, but Trey's progressed He's not doing very well. We think you ought to come back. So Emily and I drove in the middle of the night. We got to the hospital. We left at about 3 a.m. and got there at about 6 a.m. or 2 a.m. and got there at 5 a.m. I can't remember. We got there to assess the situation. And once we realized how serious it was, we called back to Newcastle, which is about three hours away. And we said, we said, we asked our neighbor if she could bring her other children to Dallas because we knew that things were progressing. There was a good chance Trey was getting ready to go and be with the Lord. And I'm telling you, all the seminary, all the pastoring, all the counseling, all the years of all that I've done, nothing could prepare you for that moment of standing there around the bedside of your seven-year-old son at this point who you knew was getting ready to step into eternity. And I've always had a special love and connection to Trey, and this, this was difficult uh, beyond words. So here we are in the hospital room. Our children have now arrived, and our doctor said at some point today, Trey is going to die. Of course, we knew that he wasn't going to die. He was about to live. That's what we knew because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. So there we are around his hospital bed and and things were getting pretty serious. Trey, what was amazing was he was with us mentally even to the end uh, of his journey on earth. He was talking, communicating with us. Oh, his eyes were closed. He couldn't open them. He was struggling. He was obviously having a difficult time. But we were all hovering around Trey, reading scripture, praying, singing, doing what we could just to keep our own hearts encouraged. The Lord was with us. And Trey, once again, in that same room that he had given his life to Christ, in that same room, Trey said, am I going to die? At this point, we knew that barring the Lord's intervention, he was going to step into eternity. And my wife, I didn't know what to say. I was stunned. And God gave my wife tremendous words. And in that moment, when he said, am I going to die? Emily, without batting an eye, said, no. She said, you're about to live. You're about to really live, Trey. And it was almost as if Trey needed that permission and that blessing from us. It it was almost as if he needed to hear that. He was done. His body was done. He had been through it all. I think he was ready. I didn't tell you that that summer in June, my wife's sister had a baby in March, lived 85 days, and the baby passed away 85 days in June. Two months later, my wife's mother, who had battled cancer for 10 years on and off, went to be with the Lord. And then two weeks after Emily's mom passed away, Trey stepped into eternity. 
It was a hard summer. Talk about learning and being able to say, God, are you really in charge of all things? So there we stood around Trey, holding him, loving him. Emily says, you're about to really live. And in just a few moments later, Trey took his last earthly breath. And I remember being around him. And I remember thinking about John 11, where Jesus said, I am the resurrection, the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. I remember January the 8th, and I remember John 5, where Jesus said, he does not, if you believe in me, he does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. In that same hospital room where Trey experienced that spiritual life when the Holy Spirit of God breathed life into him on September the 1st of 2013, he closed his earthly eyes only to open them in the presence of God. Why? Because he knew Jesus, and Jesus is the resurrection and the life. I could tell you story after story after story. However, the last year, we've had the lowest of lows and the highest of highs in our journey. I wish I could say that we've always been, woohoo, God is good and we trust him in all things. There has been times I've not wanted to get out of bed. There's been times I thought, how can I get up and preach to a people when I myself am struggling? I'm a very real and honest person. But as the apostle Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. And I stand here by the grace of God. And I stand here today because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Two, cu- two quick things and I'll wrap up. In Trey's journey, Trey was going to have to have a third bone marrow transplant. A third transplant. He never got to that third transplant. But we did a bone marrow drive in Newcastle. Over 500 people came out to have their mouth swabbed to find out if they were going to be a match for Trey. Because we were going to use a different donor. There was a man that came that night, had no connection to our church, just in the community. Heard about the bone marrow drive, had seen Trey's story on TV. He came to the bone marrow drive. That night he came as a bone marrow donor participant. Had his mouth swabbed. He enjoyed being at our church and meeting our people, so he decided to come back on a Sunday. It just happened to be a Sunday that I wasn't there. My dad was there preaching for me. That Sunday morning, that man gave his heart and life to Jesus Christ. A few months later, I had the privilege of baptizing that man. God used Trey to get him to the church. My dad to lead him to the Lord, and I had the privilege of baptizing him. Does God's purpose prevail? Amen. At Trey's funeral service, we call it a homegoing service. Over 50 people prayed to receive Christ during that service. Over the last year and a half, hundreds if not thousands of people, and this is no pastoral embellishment, have come to know Christ through our son's journey. Selfishly, do I want him back? Without question. But when I look through the eyes of faith and I say, God, do you have a purpose that prevails over all things? And are you using my son in greater ways than I could have ever possibly imagined? Trey's impacted more lives in seven short years than some will have impact over a hundred years of their life. But God had a greater purpose for the life of my son. His purpose is bringing incredible glory to his name through the life of my son. Notice I didn't say the death because Trey never died. He really lived. And anyone who believes in him shall never die but live. Amen and amen. God's purpose does prevail. And I encourage you today, no matter where you are, maybe you're like me and you'd heard many sermons on suffering and you thought, that's great. Maybe you're gonna tuck this away and God will bring it back to your mind at some point down the road. Maybe you are going through a hard season as we are. Maybe you've experienced loss or maybe you're at a place where you're saying, God, why am I where I, I don't know why you are where you are. I don't know why you're here, where this message lands with you. But I know this, God has a purpose in all things. Embrace his purpose by faith. And I promise you, God's purpose will always prevail. Trust him. He's worthy of our trust. He's the resurrection and the life. Let me pray for us. Father God, I thank you this morning for this story that we know so well and the power of it. God, we thank you that even through Lazarus' death and life, we discover even more about you. God, I thank you that through Jesus Christ, in Christ alone, through his resurrection, we too shall overcome. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, hell, where is your victory? But thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. God, we know that gift is Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for what you did in the life of our son. Thank you for continuing to use Trey's story to bring you glory. 
Help Emily and I and our family to continue to embrace that by faith and continue to point a lost and dying world. As we heard earlier in Boston, so many who don't, who've never experienced passing from death to life. God, use us to preach the good news of Jesus Christ and watch many, many more come from death to life. And God, one day we long to be with you in the new heaven and new earth with every brother and sister in Christ from every age celebrating, God, your purpose, your prevailing purpose in and through all things. God, we love you, we praise you. Thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray, amen.